brings me back to your, your point earlier about the, uh, the last chapters in Capital. Um, there's the primitive accumulation chapter, of course, but I was thinking as much about the chapter on colonies and Wakefield and the sense that you get from Marx's critique of Wakefield, uh, which is that the, the realities of the system become extraordinarily more um, vivid and apparent at a distance from the center. Yeah, I think this is our Marx's answer to, to you know, Hegel had a kind of little thing about uh, the formation of colonies and some kind of level of imperialism might be a solution to the contradictions of capitalism because Hegel had a sense that capitalism was a very contradictory force and he thought there may be a resolution that way. Now what Marx does is basically say, <coughs> no, no such thing. All you do is replicate the contradictions of capitalism on a broader scale. You make it global. You, you, you take the contradictions global. And you see in contemporary China, I think, something of that sort exactly happening now. And so, in a sense, again, what Marx does back in sort of 1867 is to write this thing which is kind of, you know, incredibly kind of prophetic about uh, where the world is going to go and how it's going to go. And it's just an, and, and so, but, but again, one of the things about teaching it all this time, if I can go back to that for a moment, is it's far easier to take the text of capital right now and integrate it with stuff from the newspaper, stuff going on around us all of the time. It's far easier to do that now than it was uh, maybe in the early 1970s when, you know, the struggles were an anti-imperialist struggle, the civil rights struggle, some struggles around labor, but labor was relatively strong at that period. I mean, not only in the United States, but also, of course, in Europe. And there were these revolutions in Europe, like in Portugal and uh, so on. And, and uh, most of us thought that socialism was just around the corner. The eighth part uh, departs somewhat from the scenery as it's uh, constructed uh, earlier on. And really what's going on in the early part, in the first seven parts, is uh, a dialogue with uh, what you might call Smithian utopianism, uh, a world in which uh, as he puts it, freedom, equality, property, and Bentham uh, have their sway and do their thing. Now Marx knows perfectly well that we don't live in a world like that, but it was, of course, the central argument of classical political economy that if only the world could be constructed like that, then the hidden hand of the market would ensure that capitalist development would, would work uh, to the benefit of all. So Marx accepts Smith's assumptions, as you will recall in chapter 2, where he kind of says it's an atomistic market, and then later on there is, of course, that line about equality, freedom, property, and Bentham. But what Marx shows is, step by step, logically, 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 that by the time you get to chapter 25, you see two consequences of the implementation of such a utopian vision. And one is a minor consequence, and the other is a major consequence. The minor consequence is that we're likely to see this uh, highly decentralized, individualistic system gradually displaced by an increasing centralization of capital. That, uh, as he puts it elsewhere, the end result of competition is inevitably some form of monopoly or oligopoly, and that therefore the end result of the Smithian world is going to be to destroy 
the idea of individualism and the competitive basis of that individualism. The major consequence, however, is quite simply that the rich grow richer and the poor grow poorer. And as he puts it, we see uh, when this system is implemented, accumulation of wealth at one pole on the part of capital, and accumulation of degradation, misery, and the like on the part of that other pole, i.e. the working class that has produced the wealth and has effectively been deprived of it by the dynamics of capitalist property relations and appropriation procedures. Now in a sense, this is a, I think you could summarize this by saying in a way this is a, an incredibly sophisticated essay on the theme that there is nothing more unequal than the equal treatment of unequals. In a sense, of course, he's made a lot of the fact that the market system is egalitarian. Equality, freedom, and the reason there's nothing more unequal than being deprived under a system of that kind is that it's very easy to have, to be, to be gulled, as it were, into the illusions about liberty and freedom that this system promotes. That, indeed, the market system is about equality and freedom. And most of us would probably consider those primary virtues. We might go so far as to say there is indeed a case for private property. We might do without Bentham, but nevertheless, this would look to us from the outside as a virtuous system. And it's easy to persuade us all that are to the virtues of this system. And historically, that of course is what capitalist class propaganda and discourse and all the rest of it has been very active in doing. But the consequences are this increasing inequality and this increasing centralization of power. Now I think it's interesting to reflect for a moment on where we've been for the last thirty years since the beginnings of, if you like, the neoliberal assault, which has precisely peddled the whole kind of virtues of the free market system of private property rights and has constantly preached, as Bush has, about freedom and liberty and, to a lesser degree, equality. And then consider what the consequences have been and ask yourself the question, is capital more centralized now than it was thirty years ago in areas like pharmaceuticals, media, banking, energy, and all the rest of it? And I think you would pretty much come to the conclusion that on that score there has been a very marked trend towards an increasing centralization of capital and increasing centralization of power. When you look at the data on inequality, you see the ratio between what the CEO got relative to the remuneration of an average employee in a corporation in 1970, and it was around 30 to 1. Now, in the United States, it's closer to 500 to 1, and there have been times when it's got closer to 1,000 to 1. The concentration of wealth in the top 0.1 percent has, of the population in the United States has doubled over the last 25 years. The concentration of wealth in the top 0.01 percent has tripled over the last 25 years. And whenever neoliberalism has struck, you immediately see the emergence of a fabulously wealthy elite. Mexico, 
one of my favorite examples. Before the grand privatization schemes of Salinas in 1988 to 1992-94, you wouldn't find any Mexicans on the, for, on the Forbes wealthiest list. Now you'll find 14 of them, and the richest man in the world is reputed now to be Carlos Slim, who made all of his money out of the privatization schemes of the Salinas administration. You will find many other examples as you go around. The degree of neoliberalization has had immense impacts on the distribution of wealth and income in society. So on this ground I think you would argue that Marx has made a plausible case that the closer we get towards the implementation of, the, of that liberal, neoliberal utopian dream, the more we're likely to realize these particular consequences. So, on that point at least, we can see something very important in terms of the analysis. But now we come to part eight, where there's nothing here about freedom and equality and Bentham and all the rest of it. It's really about a certain history of violent appropriation, of predatory behaviors, none of which can be legitimized through the market, or understood as being legitimate in terms of the rules of market exchange that Adam Smith's utopia required. So we see a completely different world in operation. And it's the world that Marx calls original accumulation, i.e., how did it all begin? And it begins with a tale of violence and violent appropriation, a violent dissolution of a pre-existing mode of production and its supplanting by a capitalist mode of production. Now in this story there is, in this section, an interesting side commentary. And what I've circulated to you is some passages from Hegel's philosophy of right. Now Marx, in one of his introductory notes to Capital, comments that he made his points about Hegel some twenty-odd years before. And what he's referring to there is a lengthy piece he wrote called A Critique of Hegel's Philosophy of Right. Now when you go read Marx's critique, there's something very interesting about it, that it ignores the first part of Hegel's discussion entirely, and starts with a consideration of paragraph 250 onwards. And what follows is a critique of Hegel's theory of the state and of civil society and the like. What passes totally ignored in that critique are the preceding few paragraphs, which are actually very strange paragraphs within Hegel's philosophy of right. Because suddenly, when you get to this paragraph 243, Hegel suddenly launches into a very interesting discussion in which he talks about the amassing of wealth on the one hand, which is being carried out through capitalistic forms of operation, and which is coupled with what he says on the other side is the subdivision and restriction of particular jobs. This results in the dependence and distress of the class tied to work of that sort. And these again entail inability to feel and enjoy the broader freedoms and especially the intellectual benefits of civil society. 
And then he goes on, when a standard of living of a large mass of people falls below a certain subsistence level, a level regulated automatically as the one necessary for a member of the society, and when there is a consequent loss of the sense of right and wrong, of honesty and self-respect, which makes a man insist on maintaining himself by his own work and effort, the result is the creation of a rabble. At the same time this brings with it, at the other end of the social scale, conditions which greatly facilitate the concentration of disproportionate wealth in a few hands. This is astonishingly similar to Marx's passage about accumulation of wealth at one pole and accumulation of misery, degradation and toil at the other pole. Hegel then goes on to suggest that there's no way in which you can actually redistribute income from the rich to the poor to ameliorate this problem. Furthermore, if you go to one of the footnotes on the next page, footnote 149, he makes some remarks about poverty and the rabble, and he talks about how many of them become dependent and be frivolous and idle, but ends with, I think, a very important idea. Against nature man can claim no right, but once society is established, poverty immediately takes the form of a wrong done to one class by another, i.e. class struggle. The important question of how poverty is to be abolished is one of the most disturbing problems which agitate modern society. The problem, of course, is still with us. Read Geoffrey Sachs on the end of poverty, which again is one of those arguments in which the free market, equality and property are going to be the major vehicles. But then, Hegel suggests that there may be a solution. As he says, this inner tension, if you like, the dialectic of class struggle inside of capitalist society, drives it, and this is top of 151 and passage 246, this inner dialectic of civil society thus drives it, or at any rate, rate drives a specific civil society, to push beyond its own limits and seek markets, and so its necessary means of subsistence in other lands which are either deficient in the goods it has overproduced or else generally backward in industry. And then again the footnote, civil society is thus driven to found colonies. And then he talks about colonial independence which proves, he says, to be of the greatest advantage to the mother country, just as the emancipation of slaves turns out to the greatest advantage of the owners. Now, this, I think, explains something which otherwise always to me seems somewhat peculiar about part eight, which is why does it end with a discussion of colonization. When the penultimate chapter ends with the expropriators being expropriated, the death knell of private property sounds and the revolution occurs, in the kind of rhetoric that you would expect of the Communist Manifesto, why suddenly is this, a, this addendum? And I think it has a lot to do with Marx trying to not only square his accounts with Adam Smith, which he's going to do in this section, in part eight, but also to square his accounts with Hegel and Hegel's account. In other words, he feels obviously some necessity to try to make clear the colonial solution is no solution. It will simply reproduce the social relations of capitalism on a broader scale, particularly given the nature of colonial land policies as advocated by Wakefield. So we have to understand that capital is always being written 
in these contexts of dialogues with various people. And of course the primary dialogue in part 8 is with Adam Smith's account of primitive or original accumulation, which was, according to Adam Smith, a peaceful affair, and it just happened that there were some people who were hard-working, and some people who were not, some people who could be bothered, some people who could not be bothered, and the result of that was that bit by bit those who were hard-working and who could be bothered accumulated some wealth, and eventually those who could not be bothered could not accumulate wealth, and in the end, in order to survive, preferred, actually, to give up their labour power as a commodity in return for a living wage. So as far as Adam Smith was concerned, this was a peaceable process. It could almost be naturalized in this kind of way, in terms of human aspirations, or the lack thereof. And of course, in all of this, it became very important in Adam Smith's account not to bring in the state as an agent of primitive accumulation. The reason being that, of course, Adam Smith's argument, as was most of classical political economy, was try and keep the state out of the story. Let there be laissez-faire, let the state withdraw, let the state just act as a kind of night watchman of what's going on, and then everything will be okay, let the market do its work. There were some areas where public investment and so on, and public health, where that didn't apply, but by and large this was the argument. So what Adam Smith and many of the other political economists tried to do was to naturalize the process of primitive accumulation. Now, there were some political economists who didn't do that. Marx mentions quite frequently the work of James Stewart. James Stewart recognized that there was a crucial role for the state in the formation of capital. And in fact, there was a line of argument within classical political economy which was subdued, which did indeed see a necessary violence which would be visited by the state in order for original accumulation to occur. There's a book published two or three years ago, or maybe more, uh, by Michael Perelman called The Invention of Capitalism, or The Invention of Capital. And he does an extremely good job of going back across all of the classical political economists and sort of looking at them and saying what did they argue, what did they not argue. And he focuses very strongly on James Stewart, and he talks about the way in which Adam Smith spent a great deal of time evading and avoiding, and in many instances avoiding, James Stewart's arguments, in order to create this myth of original accumulation. Now, of course, for Marx, then, this is a total myth. So his account is one of fraud, of predatory behaviors, of violence, illegality, and eventually the appropriation of state power. So what he says here is immediately what he says is that the methods of primitive accumulation are anything but Id Id idyllic. In actual history it is a notorious fact that conquest, enslavement, robbery, murder, in short, force, play the greatest part. Now here he's going to refer back immediately to earlier passages in Capital, back around page 273, 
Marx there is talking about the sale and purchase of labour power. So on page 273 he says this, Why this free worker confronts him in the sphere of circulation is a question which does not interest the owner of money, for he finds the labour market in existence as a particular branch of the commodity market. And for the present it interests us just as little. We confine ourselves to the fact theoretically, as he does practically. One thing, however, is clear. Nature does not produce, on the one hand, owners of money or commodities, and on the other hand, men possessing nothing but their own labour power. This relation has no basis in natural history, nor does it have a social basis common to all periods of human history. It is clearly the result of a past historical development, the product of many economic revolutions, of the extinction of a whole series of older formations of social production. What he's now doing now, what he's now doing is saying, we need to look at this process of historical development. And it is this process that is being set up for an examination in part eight. He similarly has invoked earlier prior forms of capital, usury and merchant's capital, which he earlier described as antediluvian forms of capital. It is through the collision of those forms and the feudal system that we see the emergence of a true capitalist class. Because what we're seeing is the separation of the workers from control over the means of production. As he says on the bottom of 874, the process which creates the capital relation can be nothing other than the process which divorces the worker from the ownership of the conditions of his own labour. It is a process which operates two transformations, whereby the social means of subsistence and production are turned into capital, and the immediate producers are turned into wage labourers. So-called primitive accumulation, therefore, is nothing else than the historical process of divorcing the producer from the means of production. It appears as primitive because it forms a prehistory of capital, and of the mode of production corresponding to capital. Interesting point here. Marx seems, even though he uses the word appears, to be suggesting that primitive accumulation is part of the prehistory of capital. And once it is over, as he says on the preceding page, once these two classes are configured, then their relation is set and you don't need any more primitive accumulation. This historical movement, he says, on the one hand was an emancipatory movement, notice that. It was an emancipatory movement from serfdom and from the fetters of the guilds. And it is this aspect of the movement which alone exists for our bourgeois historians. You emphasize the good side. On the other hand, these newly freed men became sellers of themselves only after they had been robbed of all of their own means of production and all the guarantees of existence afforded by the old feudal arrangements. And this history, the history of their expropriation, is written in the annals of mankind in letters of blood and fire. The most recent example of that would be the taking away of the iron rice bowl in China which guaranteed a certain standard of living to the mass of the population, and the creation of a wage labour force, again, a lot of it through considerable violence in the countryside. So the history of pr primitive accumulation then is this history, a violent separation of a population from its means of production. But he does concede, at the end of this chapter on 876, that the history of this expropriation assumes different aspects in different countries, and runs through its various phases in different orders of succession and at different historical epochs. Only in England, which we therefore take as our example, has it the classic form. Here too we should signal some questions. 
why is England the classic form? What does it mean to say, well, it could take different forms in different places, different times? Is there a general process of primitive accumulation, or are we dealing with a great deal of diversity of historical transformations? What he makes clear here is that he is going to use England as the case which he's going to appeal to as the exemplary case, in much the same way that he used Manchester industry as the exemplary case for understanding the development of the factory system. So chapter 27 then takes up the expropriation of the agricultural population from the land. And there are two aspects to this, and here he does indeed quote Sir James Stewart on 878. First off, you're going to dispossess a peasant population. But then the dissolution of the feudal system also released a whole mass of feudal retainers who had nowhere to go and who had lost, in a sense, their protections and their protected system situation within house and castle. The lords, he suggests, the feudal lords, to the degree they could do so, not only got rid of their retainers, which turned them into wage labourers, but also appropriated the common lands and set themselves up in a way as landed capitalists. Now at first, and this is where I think Marx's story is particularly interesting, in, in the initial phases of this, this process occurred illegally through individual exploitation and expropriation and predation and violence. And so for the first 150 years, he says, after Henry VII, there was an attempt by state law to control that process, to roll it back. But it didn't work. The lawlessness was too powerful. But then, after the 16th century and the Reformation, as he says on 881, the process of forcible expropriation received a new and terrible impulse. Colossal spoliation of church property and the formation, again, of a landed aristocracy that was concerned with commodity production. But then, on 883, he talks about how, how after the restoration of the Stuarts, the landed proprietors carried out by legal means, that is, they got control of the state apparatus, and then they used the state apparatus to engage in enclosure of common lands, and the usurpation of common property rights. And this was consolidated, as he says, on 884 by what historians like to refer to as the Glorious Revolution, which brought into power, along with William of Orange, the landed and capitalist profit grubbers. They inaugurated a new era by practicing on a colossal scale the thefts of state lands which had hitherto been managed more modestly. The estates were given away, sold at ridiculous prices, or even annexed to private estates by direct seizure. All of this happened without the slightest observance of legal etiquette. The crown lands thus fraudulently appropriated, together with the stolen church estates, insofar as these were not lost again during the Republican Revolution, form the basis of the present princely domains of the English oligarchy. Then comes the consolidation of English bourgeois power over the state apparatus. And the landed aristocracy, he says, moved into alliance with the new bankocracy of newly hatched high finance and of the large manufacturers at that time dependent on protective duties. So all of this meant that communal property disappeared, 
private property began to dominate, and the state moved in behind that system. And the result, he says, and again it's interesting to think about this, on 886 was, the 18th century, however, did not yet, re yet recognize as fully as the 19th the identity between the wealth of the nation and the poverty of the people. I think this is a, a very useful thing to reflect upon. How many nations which have grown extremely wealthy in the last thirty years have done so as their populations have become increasingly impoverished? So this then proceeds not only through the enclosure of the common lands, but after the common lands are enclosed, then you actually start to expel people from their villages. And this is where you start to get all that elegiac poetry, um, Gray and Oliver Goldsmith and all the rest of it about the loss of the rural culture of, of Britain as a result of the expulsions and the destruction of village life. What Marx does is to prefer to use the famous example of the Duchess of Sutherland, who on the one hand, as he says in the footnote on 892, entertained Mrs. Be Mrs. Beecher Stowe, author of this, authoress of Uncle Tom's Cabin, with great magnificence in London to show her sympathy for the Negro slaves of the American Republic, while expelling all of the crofters from the Highlands in one of the huge Highland clearances which, again, cast people away from their traditional forms of livelihood and led them either to emigrate, as many of them did, or to end up as proletarians in the cities. So the summary of this argument is given at the end of this chapter on 895, where he says, The spoliation of the church's property, the fraudulent alienation of the state domains, the theft of the common lands, the usurpation of feudal and clan property, and its transformation into modern private property under circumstances of ruthless terrorism, all these things were just so many idyllic methods of primitive accumulation. They conquered the field for capitalist agriculture, incorporated the soil into capital, interesting notion, the commodification of the land, the commodification of the soil, actually makes the soil a medium through which capital starts to circulate, and created for the urban industries the necessary supplies of free and rightless proletarians. In chapter 28 what we see is what happens to these people when they get thrown off the land. What happens is, they become vagabonds, they become paupers, in some cases they go into becoming highwaymen and robbers and all the rest of it. So what we here find is the power of the state starts to be utilized as a disciplinary apparatus on relationship, in relationship to those people who have been dispossessed of their livelihoods. And the story which Marx tells here is quite simply that state power is used, state powers of incarceration, of violent punishment and all the rest of it, uh, become actually standard practices, and in fact you're saying to all of the people who have been dispossessed, you either become good proletarians, or else you're going to suffer from the disciplines of this state apparatus. And along with that, you have uh, legislation over wages, so the wages can't be too high. You have legislation on the minimum length of the working day, which we've encountered earlier, as opposed to the maximum length, and we get a whole series of barbarous laws against combinations of workers, 
which accuse them of treasonous activity if they try to combine together to improve their lot. So the bloody legislation against the expropriated is a, a pretty awful tale, where you cut out people's tongues and you do violent things of this sort, just simply to demonstrate to people that they have to join the proletariat or else. This leads into a very short chapter on the genesis of the capitalist farmer, in which what we find is quite simply that bailiffs and managers of farms became sharecroppers, but then could start to use increases in productivity to make themselves independently wealthy. So whereas we had before a landed aristocracy that was interested in using the land for commercial purposes, particularly sheep rearing and wool and all the rest of it, what we now find are not landed aristocrats anymore, but a class of farmers who are emerging out of this system as they pay rents to the landed aristocracy, and at the same time manage to utilize their position on the land and their employment of wage labor to accumulate wealth for themselves, and they start to become an independent, wealthy class. Which then leads into chapter 30, because in chapter 29 the necessary condition for that to occur was rising productivity on the land. And rising productivity on the land meant less employment of labor on the land, and increasing commodification of agricultural labor. In other words, whereas you may have a lot of small peasant proprietors, they've now been pushed off the land, even the small proprietors who paid rent to the landlord become bigger proprietors and the smaller proprietors disappear, they start, because of the improvement in agricultural productivity, to release labor. So you get a landless agricultural proletariat. And the only way that landless agricultural proletariat can survive is by buying commodities, which increases the demand for commodities, at the same time as it pushes this landless proletariat to seek employment as wage labor, either elsewhere in agriculture or else elsewhere in the towns and in industry. So the commodification of rural relations becomes a critical moment in this transformation. And it's a commodification of products, so that instead of the products being consumed by those who produce them in a self-subsistence agriculture, you find the products are being sent to market at the same time as the demand comes from the market and the demanders are those who have to sell their labor power in order to live. This creation of the home market is something which is, I think, worth noting. The, in, in the rest of the first part of Capital, you remember, he suggested there's no problem in the market. But here he's saying that the creation of a market is a crucial step. And I think it's interesting right now that one of the major things that's being said to the Chinese is that you should stimulate your home market. And in many instances, the politics of conquest of the home domestic market has become a very important part of political projects. So that this general argument that Marx is making about the significance of, the, of home market formation and the colonization of the home market is something which we really need to pay very general attention to. And it is this home market 
which is going to be crucial for the development of industrial capitalism. Because without it, where would the capitalists sell their products to? You can't, as he's done in the earlier part of Capital, assume that there's no problem. You have to assume there's a big problem, and here Marx is talking about the way in which it can be solved. Now when we get to the industrial capitalist in chapter 31, we're going to be talking in the first instance about another form of revolution, which is not about small craft workshops becoming slightly bigger and the concentration of capital, if you like. It's going to be about the way in which usurers' capital and merchants' capital become transformed and, as it were, the vehicles for the formation of the industrial capitalist. As he says on 9.15, the money capital formed by means of usury and commerce was prevented from turning into industrial capital by the feudal organization of the countryside and the guild organization of the towns. These fetters vanished with the dissolution of the feudal band of retainers and the expropriation and partial eviction of the rural population. The new manufactures were established at seaports or at points in the countryside which were beyond the control of the old municipalities and their guilds. Hence in England the bitter struggle of the corporate towns against these new seedbeds of industry. This was a very interesting observation on Marx's part. The trade guilds were very powerful. Many city corporations were governed by the burghers and by the guilds. And it was very difficult to break the power of the guilds. So cities like Bristol, Norwich, and many others of that sort, had very powerful institutions to maintain the status quo of political economic power, both on the part of the merchant capitalists, but also on the part of the guild workers. So what did you do? What you find was the movement to what we now call greenfield sites. You went to villages with names like Manchester, or Birmingham, or Bolton, or Blackburn, or Leeds. And in these villages you started building factories. There was no way in which the guilds could control you. Their control was strictly confined within the city jurisdiction. The merchant capitalists couldn't control you either and in very short order the merchant capitalists decided there was a great deal of business to be done and were prepared then to start to do business with the Manchester industrialists, the Birmingham industrialists, the Leeds industrialists and the like. So the whole pattern of industrialization in Britain occurred outside of the leading city centres. And it is, I think, extremely interesting to look at the long history of capitalism in terms of its perpetual seeking out of greenfield sites where political and economic powers can be bypassed. What did Japanese auto companies do when they came to the United States? Did they go to Detroit? What did they do when they went to Britain? Did they go to Birmingham? No, they set up on greenfield sites, where labor organization was weak, where regulatory restrictions were relatively modest. And so the whole history 
of capitalism has been about a perpetual move away from concentrations of political and economic power which are inimical to a certain form of development and looking for some place where you could actually do whatever you wanted to do. The deindustrialization of New York City began in the 1960s because union power was very strong here. And in the first wave of deindustrialization, it was simply a move to the suburbs. Get out of the city. Where there's too much political and economic control by labor. Go to the suburbs. Then you found one better. You said, well, let's go to North Carolina instead. And you could go one further. You can go, well, let's go to Alabama. Let's go to the American West. Go beyond that. Let's go to the Maquila Zone of Mexico. Let's go to, Mex let's go to China. So, what Marx is talking about here is a very important process of geographical shifts which are fundamental to what a bourgeois capitalism is about. And of course those geographical shifts are at the heart of uneven geographical development. What follows is a more general discussion of how the industrial capitalist came to dominate so quickly and so fast. And the first thing you notice is the role that the colonies pay, play, as he says on 915, the colonies, the national debt, the modern tax system, and the system of protection. These methods depend in part on brute force, for instance the colonial system. They all employ the power of the state, the concentrated and organized force of society to hasten, as in a hothouse, the process of transformation of the feudal mode of production into the capitalist mode and to shorten the transition. Force is the midwife of every old society which is pregnant with a new one. It is itself an economic power, and of course it is the state which is going to be the primary agent in the utilization of that force. Now I'd make an argument that far from the state being irrelevant in the rise of a neoliberal order, as some people claim, the state has played a crucial role in being a midwife of history by using state force to try to absolutely ensure something akin to a neoliberal utopian dream was going to be constructed via things like the national debt, the modern tax system and the like. Marx talks about the way in which state power got utilized. In the first instance, state monopoly power through the East India Company. The way in which money was made at the opium trade. The way in which they created a famine in order to jack prices up that they could profit immensely. But then we get these, I think, very important statements. 918, the colonial system ripened trade and navigation as in a hothouse. 918, the colonies provided a market for the budding manufacturers and a vast increase in accumulation which is guaranteed by the mother country's monopoly of the market. The treasures captured outside Europe by undisguised looting, enslavement and murder flowed back to the mother country. And then he talks about the way in which commercial supremacy produces industrial predominance in the period of manufacture, and how the system of public credit, national debts and so on, played a very important role in all of this. And as he says, you should take this on board, with the rise of national debt making, lack of faith in the national debt takes the place of the sin 
against the Holy Ghost for which there is no forgiveness. You know the ticker tape board which records the national debt? Seen it down in Union Square? Total national debt? You see it going up like this, like crazy. It's absolutely astonishing. And you better have faith in it, right? If you don't have faith in it, then if you get scared by it, then wow. The public debt, he says, becomes one of the most powerful levers of primitive accumulation. Furthermore, it gives rise to an emergence, as he says on 920, of a, a brood of bankocrats, financiers, rentiers, brokers, stock jobbers. Along with the national debt, there arose an international credit system. It's very prescient analysis, this. One of its main lines of business from 1701 to 1706 was the lending out of enormous amounts of capital, since part of Holland, especially to its great rival England. The same thing is going on today between England and the United States. So that transfers of capital, capital exports, capital movements, and then the modern system of taxation on 921. And we see very clearly how that's been working today. So that 922, he summarizes this a bit in the following way. Colonial system, public debts, heavy taxes, protection, commercial wars, etc. These offshoots of the period of manufacture swell to gigantic proportions during the period of infancy of large-scale industry. The birth of the latter is celebrated by a vast Herod-like slaughter of the innocents. A Herod-like slaughter, however, which absorbs masses of otherwise redundant labor into the factory system. And finding those laborers, as he points out on 923, was in itself became part of the state organization. Uh, the different parish workhouses of London, Birmingham and elsewhere sent their surplus populations to the industrial districts. Furthermore, he points out, the trade in labour didn't even stop with that. And on 924 he talks about the way in which England acquired the right to supply Spanish America until 1743 with 4,800 Negroes a year. This threw an official cloak over British smuggling. Liverpool grew fat on the basis of the slave trade. This was its method of primitive accumulation. Which ends, much as the Hegelian argument comes back in, on 925, where he talks about the eternal natural laws of the capitalist mode of production, the eternal natural laws in inverted commas, to complete the process of separation between the workers and conditions of their labor to transform at one pole the social means of production of subsistence into capital, <coughs> and at the opposite pole the mass of the population into wage laborers into the free labouring poor, that artificial product of modern industry. So, if money comes into the world with a congenital blood stain on one cheek, he says, capital comes dripping from head to toe, from every pore, with blood and dirt. Which leads into chapter 32. He summarizes his argument, and again I want to come back to this. At a certain stage of development, he says on 928, it brings into the world the material means of its own destruction. From that moment new forces and new passions spring up in the bosom of society. This is again Marx always saying that you don't see radical breaks, you always see something emergent from within. But these forces and passions feel themselves to be fettered by that society. It has to be annihilated, it is annihilated. 
its annihilation, the transformation of the individualized and scattered means of production into socially concentrated means of production. The transformation, therefore, of the dwarf-like property of the many into the giant property of the few, and the expropriation of the great mass of the people from the soil, from the means of subsistence and the instruments of labour, this terrible and arduously accomplished expropriation of the mass of the people forms the prehistory of capital. It comprises a whole series of forcible methods, and we have only passed in review those that have been epoch-making as methods of the primitive accumulation of capital. As soon as this metamorphosis, he goes on, has sufficiently decomposed the old society, as soon as the workers have turned into proletarians and their means of labour into capital, as soon as the capitalist mode of production stands on its own feet, the further socialization of labour and the further transformation of the soil and other means of production into socially exploited, and therefore communal means of production, take on a new form. What is now to be expropriated is not the self-employed worker, but the capitalist who exploits a large number of workers. And so then we come to the idea of the revolt of the working classes, the recognition, as he says, the entanglement of all peoples in the net of the world market, and with this the growth of the international character of the capitalist regime, and the centralization of the means of production and socialization of labour reach a point at which they become incompatible with their capitalist integument. This integument is burst asunder, the nail of capitalist private property sounds. The expropriators are expropriated. A revolution occurs. What Marx does here is to talk about the theory of colonization. Actually, it has very little to do with the actual processes of colonization in Australia. Uh, it really has to do with the ideas of Wakefield about colonization. And uh, Wakefield, uh, Marx uh, refrains from no noting, wrote his. Uh, uh, expositions on the colonial system while he was in jail for having tried to kidnap the daughter of a very wealthy individual. What he was aiming to do with her, we don't know. Uh, but anyway, he spent three or four years in jail, and while he was in jail, he decided he'd do something amusing to himself. So he wrote this uh, book about uh, colonization. And what Marx is kind of making of this is that. Wakefield at least recognizes that if you have a colonial system where the, where the uh, immigrants are free to gain land for themselves and do whatever they want, then there's, there's, no free, there's no labor for the capitalist. And so Marx enjoys the case of the <coughs> capitalist who went there with all of the capital and all of the stock and <coughs> all of the seeds but found they couldn't use it because they couldn't find any labour. So what Wakefield insisted was that colonial land policy should do two things. It should put a reserve price on land, i.e. make land scarce, so that there was a barrier to the free occupancy of the land, and that, uh, secondly, you would try to put restrictions on labour movement, labour migration, <coughs> in such a way uh, that there was always a surplus of labour available to you. And what Marx does is to recognise that in the United States there was a problem of this kind, that people were coming to the United States <coughs> and given there was free land on the frontier, they were disappearing. Uh, okay, some residual groups were left in uh, the uh, cities, but still there was a labour scarcity, a labour shortage. And what you needed to take care of this was somehow or other do something different with the land. And of course what starts to happen with the granting of the you know, rights to railroads and all those kinds of things is you start to allow the monopolization of the land, commodification of the land and the expropriation of the land by larger and larger groups in the population. So again in the United States there's a fight, as it were, between free labour on the frontier and wage labour in the cities, and the balance is 
is there and what Wakefield is going to talk about is saying in a place like Australia, the colonial office should put, should have a clear uh, land policy which totally undermines the argument of Adam Smith about the peaceable way in which this would happen. If Adam Smith was correct, <coughs> then what you would see happening in Australia would be presumably an Adam Smith story all over again, but it doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen at all that way. So what, what Marx is appreciative of is the fact that you know, Wakefield at least understands what you need in order to, uh, in order to accumulate. As he says on 932, Wakefield discovered that in the colonies property in money, means of subsistence, machines and other means of production does not as yet stamp a man as a capitalist if the essential complement to these things is missing, the wage labourer, the other man, the other, who is compelled to sell himself of his own free will. He discovered that capital is not a thing but a social relation between persons which is mediated through things. Sound familiar? This idea that capital is a social relation, mediated through things, is fundamental to a lot of Marx's argument. And so he goes into you know, Wakefield's argument and gives some examples. And recognizes that state land policy, as I suggested, as he says on 938, is to kill two birds with one stone. Let the government set an artificial price on the virgin soil, a price independent of the law of supply and demand, a price that compel, compels the immigrant to work a long time for wages before he can earn enough money to buy land and turn himself into an independent farmer. <coughs> the fund resulting from the sale of land at a price relatively prohibitory for the wage labourers, this fund of money extorted from the wages of labour by a violation of the sacred law of supply and demand, is to be applied by the government in proportion to its growth to the importation of paupers from Europe into the colonies, so as to keep the wage labour market full for the capitalists. Under this plan, Wakefield exclaims triumphantly, the supply of labour must be constant and regular. The lesson, he says right at the end, is that the only thing that interests us in the secret discovered in the new world by the political economy of the old world and loudly proclaimed by it, that the capitalist mode of production and accumulation, and therefore capitalist private property as well, have for their fundamental condition the annihilation of that private property which rests on the labour of the individual himself, in other words, the expropriation of the worker. In other words, John Locke has to be perverted, inverted, into a system of expropriation. And the Lockean vision, supplemented by the Adam Smith story, is not an adequate discussion of primitive accumulation. Now quite a lot of people since then have suggested that it's not part of the prehistory, it's an ongoing part of what capital accumulation is about. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg, for example, here's what she has to say. She says, uh, find my right glasses. Oh, where did I put my glasses? Oh, my pocket. Put my glasses somewhere. This is what Rosa Luxemburg says. She suggests that capital accumulation, the history of capital accumulation, has a dual character. One concerns the commodity market and the place where surplus value is produced, the factory, the mine, the agricultural estate. Regarded in this light, accumulation is a purely economic process with its most important phase a transaction between the capitalist and the wage labourer. Here in form, at any rate, peace, property and equality prevail and the keen dialectics of scientific analysis were required to reveal how the right of ownership changes in the course of accumulation into appropriation of other people's property, how commodity exchange turns into exploitation, 
and equality becomes class rule. And this, of course, was what Marx did in Capital. Volume 1. The other aspect of the accumulation of capital concerns the relations between capitalism and the non-capitalist modes of production, which start making their appearance on the international stage. Its predominant methods are colonial policy, an international loan system, a policy of spheres of interest, and war. Force, fraud, oppression, looting are openly displayed without any attempt at concealment, and it requires an effort to discover within this tangle of political violence and contests of power the stern laws of the economic process. In her view, there was organic connection between these two forms of accumulation, and in her view, the whole history of capitalism had to be read through the duality of the continuation of primitive accumulation alongside of this expanded reproduction process which Marx has outlined in Volume 1 of Capital. <coughs> Now, she had some good theoretical reasons for making that argument. We don't, I won't go into them, but you can find them out on your own. But nevertheless, there are many people, including me, who would argue that primitive accumulation has never gone away. And indeed, it has taken on new forms and has played a very significant role in the way in which capitalism functions. In Rosa Luxemburg's argument, primitive accumulation largely occurred at the periphery of capitalism. It was the sort of thing that was being done to India and China. It was the sort of thing that was being engaged in in the, in the, in the colonies. But later on, when you get decolonization and you start to get neo-colonialism and the like, you start to find completely different methods entering into the picture you find the forcible extraction of resources, uh, the violent appropriation of, of rights to the land, uh, the violent dispossession of peasant populations. And if you go back and you look at Marx's categories of primitive accumulation, the dispossession of peasant populations, when did that stop? Is it still going on? Isn't this actually what's been happening in Mexico, much of Latin America, dispossession of rural populations in China? Hasn't this been going on pretty much everywhere? So that hasn't gone away. And when Marx talks about the international credit system and the public debt, have they disappeared? Or are they, in fact, major means for the extraction of surpluses from all around the world? In other words, when you start to look at the bankocracy, the financiers, all their predatory behavior, has that gone away? If it had gone away, Wall Street would not exist. So, in fact, all of the mechanisms that Marx talks about in there when you extract from this idea it all went on back then and you project it into the present, you would say it's going on right now, all around us. Money is being expropriated. Rights are being taken away. We're not only talking about rights to land, we're talking about also rights which have been very hard won through political struggle give you an example. United Airlines declares bankruptcy. In order to come out of bankruptcy, it goes to the judge and says, we can't honor our pensions or our health care programs. The judge says, fine. So suddenly people find themselves no longer with assets which they thought they had. That is thievery. It is robbery. It is legalized robbery, sanctioned by the courts. The result is that when you go and hear interviews with United Airlines employees who thought they were going to be retired on $80,000 a year, $90,000 a year, something like that, suddenly find that the government 
insurance program only gives them $30,000 a year, so what do they have to do? They have to re-proletarianize themselves at age 65 in order to live. This is what primitive accumulation is like, and so I don't like the term primitive because it makes it sound like it went on back there, so that's why I call it accumulation by dispossession. And if you look at what's happened to family farms in this country, if you look at what's happened to pension rights, if you look at what's happened to health care rights, all of those things, in a sense, it's accumulation by dispossession. And if you ask yourself the question, if a hedge fund owner last year made $1.7 billion in one year, where the hell did that money come from? It came from somewhere. It came from, I would argue, accumulation by dispossession. People are being thrown off the land. We see legal ways in which this is done. Eminent domain, for example, is being used to displace whole neighborhoods with box stores. This is a legalized form of accumulation by dispossession. If we look at the despoliation of environments, the destruction of natural resources, again this is accumulation by dispossession. In this case, you're despoiling the global commons. And what we see with global warming is you're seeing the despoliation of the global commons through pollution and the like. All of this is going on. Now, in the history of what Marx is talking about this period of the 16th, 17th centuries, there's some fabulous accounts of the class struggles that went on around that, the levelers and the diggers and all those other elements in British society, which were violently resisting accumulation by dispossession. They were not yet in the wage labor force, but they were resisting the dispossession that was occurring to them. In fact, in the 17th and 18th century, the primary forms of class struggle were anti-proletarianization, were anti-primitive accumulation, or anti-dispossession. And the same thing works today. A lot of global struggles are being waged against dispossession. And this comes back to the question of which form of class struggle is going to be at the heart of any kind of revolutionary movement. Now I've made the argument in the brief history of neoliberalism that capitalism since the 1970s under neoliberalism has not been very good at generating growth. Therefore, the immense quantities of money which have accumulated in the upper classes has almost certainly not come out of growth. A lot of it has come through accumulation by dispossession. And I would argue that there's much more accumulation by dispossession going on since the 1970s relative to what occurred in the 1950s and 1960s, even though in the 1950s and 60s it was there, no question, particularly in terms of robbery of resource and environmental transformations. But what we've seen is the resurgence of mechanisms of accumulation by dispossession in which the credit system, which Marx mentions here as a primary vehicle for this, the credit system has become the cutting edge for accumulation by dispossession. What is going on in the subprime mortgage crisis? What we're seeing is people losing their homes. Who are losing their homes? relatively poor people, majority African-American or Hispanic, highly concentrated in certain zones of, the, of certain cities. This high concentration of foreclosures is a massive dispossession which is infecting, of course, the whole financial system. And you might like to think that, oh well, at least some of the people on Wall Street are being hurt. <laughs> 
But actually, I don't know if you've noticed something, but all of those leaders of Merrill Lynch and Citibank and so on who've been forced to step down, they kept every penny of the remuneration they had during all those years when they were backing this mortgage and subprime mortgage bonanza. And not only that, as they step down, they get a golden handshake worth $100 million. Whereas a poor person in Cleveland who leaves, loses their home gets nothing. This is the dynamics of accumulation by dispossession. And part of my argument would be that the political struggles against accumulation by dispossession are just as important as the traditional proletarian movements have been. But traditional proletarian movements in the unions and in the political parties which have sprung, sprung out of that have not been very cognizant of or even concerned with accumulation by dispossession. So when you hear about the World Social Forum or you go to any of the World Social Forums, what you're likely to hear is a lot of talk about accumulation by dispossession and quite a lot of antagonism towards traditional union forms of organization. So that you'll find in Brazil, for example, that an organization which is against dispossession, that is the Brazilian landless peasants movement, is not necessarily in alliance with the PT, the Workers' Party, which has a more kind of traditional urban proletarian base. And part of my argument would be to say if Rosa Luxemburg is right and there's an organic relation between these two forms of accumulation, and if the history of capitalism is about these two forms of accumulation working together, then we have to look at our contemporary era in that way. But we also have to construct the idea of an oppositional force. If you like, an oppositional force of the dispossessed. Workers who are dispossessed of surplus capital in the labor process and people who are being dispossessed of their assets, their rights, through accumulation by dispossession elsewhere. And I think the idea that comes out of Marx that primitive accumulation is simply in the prehistory is erroneous and has to be modified into a different configuration if we're to come up with any kind of politics uh, of the current moment. But then I would argue this was true even back then. And Mao recognized that when he started to talk about peasant worker alliances. Gramsci recognized that when he started to talk about the Northern Bloc alliance with the Southern Bloc alliance. In other words, there is a history within Marxism of taking these kinds of ideas seriously. And I would want to push them even further than they've been taken historically because I think this is a terribly important conjuncture to get the idea of who <coughs> the dispossessed are and what political possibilities come out of their mobilization is crucial for finding ways out of the current impasse as to what capitalism is about. With that, we've come to the end of our reading of Capital. So next time, what I want you to do is I want you to read the first chapter again and think about what Marx is doing there. See how well you understand it. And in particular, to think about fetishism. And think of the number of times in which the idea of fetishism, that is, it seems this way, but it's another. How many times does that crop up throughout this text? I think what you'll find is this, it occurs again and again and again and again. And you will start to see that as you go through. So do a revision. And at the same time, speculate a little bit about where this analysis can help us understand the political economy of capitalism more generally, and actually help us predict a little bit where Marx is going to go in volumes two and three, because as I've suggested, volume one is a foundation for volumes two and three, and it doesn't cover everything in volumes two and three, but it certainly highlights some of the problems which need to be taken up 
in volumes two and three. So we'll talk about that next time. Thank you.